Hello everyone and welcome back to Around the World in 80 Planes. For this flight I'm going from Karachi to Mumbai in a Yak-40. And the reason I picked a Yak-40 is because it is an exquisite Yak-40 and it is freeware but it's basically payware grade. Um, I had to do the startup procedure though, it didn't uh, come uh, ready to start uh, with engines running and I had to go through the startup procedure but thankfully it had a checklist for me. I don't know if I've done it perfectly though. Thankfully there was an English language patch for everything so you can see start on ground on the side there and uh, English labels. Uh, originally the plane did not have English labels, it was all in Russian. And so yeah, we'll see how well I did that. There's all sorts of stuff like these uh, additional panels like the breakers. Um, you can see English labels but uh, again um, if you don't have the English language patch, it's it's in Cyrillic. Uh, some of it's still in Cyrillic, actually, if you take a look. And there's a ground service thing. There's a whole panel with different cameras. And uh, so you can see the cabin. And uh, there's a loading diagram. There's all this info and a slide rule and settings. Uh, I set real startup down, but it didn't seem to do anything for me. <laughs> Honestly, I tried to, I tried to get to startup on its own, but no, I had to go through the checklist and actually look at a video on YouTube, uh, thanks to the video from uh, Mayani, uh, M A E Y A N I E, because <laughs> otherwise I wouldn't have gotten through it. Actually, this version is slightly different than the version in that video. The checklist went a little bit differently. But anyway, it's got all sorts of stuff going on, and as you can see, the cockpit is really well done and all clickable. So yeah, we'll see if I've got it right. This is the exterior. Uh, the Yak-40 is an interesting plane, not a particularly fast plane, and it's gonna take a while to get to Mumbai from Karachi, more than an hour. Uh, the flaps are interesting. The flaps uh, don't obey my flat lever exactly the way I want it to. Uh, so I might have to control them manually and the way you control them manually is actually this retract switch here. So I'll have to actually use that switch to bring them up. Anyway, um, flaps fail. I, I hope we haven't already busted the flaps on the ground. Oh, honestly. Anyway, let's get going. Of course, I'm going to be continuing with the Apollo 12 audio and they're on their way back from the moon and let's see how this all goes. Uh, there we go. All right, so throttle up. 12, go ahead. And breaks off. Apparently I have a co-pilot. Huge I wing. I wish I understood what he was saying. Well, that sounds like rotate or something. Yep, I can get off the ground. Oh no! Whoa. Ooh, that's an interesting sound. I tried to retract the gear, but they're not retracting. Okay, I have to press G. I have retract gear on a lever, but that doesn't seem to work. Oh god. Okay, well, now it seems retracted. All right, uh, I'll need to bring up the. Ooh, we're gonna stall at this rate. <laughs> oh, this is gonna. This is an interesting start. This is an interesting start. Let's face it. So I need to get to that switch. That we didn't have data. No, we the underway. The first mark, so we really weren't sure where you stood in the total flow. Oh, stalling. <laughs> yeah, this is a great flight to start off with. All right, uh, the flaps appear to be not quite up yet. Okay, we done? Uh, perfectly normal Yak-40 flight, I assure you. 
negative on that. Uh, we got it uh, recorded. And well, it didn't so say I busted anything. So we've got a hope. Look on the bright side. <laughs> okay, Crazy good. thing. Very good. So Apollo control, US My fault for putting the gear and flaps on actual uh, axes. I guess that was not expected. That conversation uh, with Dick Gordon, who is uh, going through his uh, star sighting navigation program. Coming up on it's got three engines, star. sort of like a 727 style, but smaller. Apollo 12, now 177,917.5 nautical miles away from Earth. Traveling at a speed of 3,078.4 feet per second. I mean, it all looks great, this and it's certainly functional. Houston. Very pleased with this. Uh, the same playmaker, Felis, or Felis, uh, made a Yak 20, uh, not a Yak, uh, AN24 that might feature later on. I only found these recently. Uh, previously, when I did the, these flights, uh, this is the last flight I actually previously did on Twitch before I decided to stop that and do them specifically for YouTube and the first time I did this flight I did an Embraer E190 okay. that will feature later on as well but then I found these planes so I decided to sneak this one in here okay take the uh, glycol of that temperature in to manual and adjust the primary Glycol of that in valve to obtain a temperature uh, of the glycol evaporator out of 55 degrees. I think Aeroflot d did operate out of Karachi okay, but never valve, flying to Mumbai. As far as I know. May uh, maybe to Mumbai. I don't know. Roger. I'll have to check on that. Uh, Pete, on that last uh, procedure, we want to adjust the evap temperature out to 55 degrees. I wonder how long it's going to take me to get to 34,000 feet with this. If I can get there, let me take a look at the stats on it. Not sure what its uh, max altitude is. It's not. Even though it's got little jets, it's not a very fast plane. It's 342 miles an hour top speed. Mach 0.7 only. Warming the cabin slightly. Somewhat earlier, Pete Conrad had reported to mission control. Amount of time I took to start it up, I don't know how much fuel it has left. Probably guzzling fuel on the pad. Uh, on the We're I say pad. At, uh, on the apron. Minutes, and we presently show on our displays. Service ceiling 26,000 feet. 177,697 nautical miles away from Earth, and traveling at a velocity of uh, 3,082.9 feet per second. This is Apollo Control, Houston. So, I don't know if this is available on the .org website, but if you just type in Phyllis Yak 40, F E L I S Yak 40, you should be able to find it. There's also a TU 154. I wonder if that's the one I've. Uh, no, I didn't fly a TU 154. I flew a TU 134 before. Um. I have the TU-154 scheduled for later on. But, the t uh, but that's not uh, the one that Fellas made, I think. Roger, Pete. We've got you loud and clear. Say, you you're getting pretty doggone good at this cap comment, aren't you? I think there's still Ed Gibson. He's got a good voice for the Capcoming. 
Like I say, however, Paul Weitz is a real sleep expert. <laughs> That's Paul Weitz's reputation. I don't think we've gotten to hear much of Paul Weitz because he's the sleep expert. Yeah, you went through a few. Uh, Paul White uh, came in here and was waiting six and a half hours for the big moment. Then he overslept and uh, he went out of here with a long face again. <laughs> Let me turn up the volume on the However, he's hollow out audio. Entry. He's assuming you're not going to be sleeping through that. I don't know if you guys can hear it properly. I don't think we will be. So there's Karachi for you. Pretty good view. Uh, More music. Houston, the engines are three AI-25 turbofans, 14.7 kilonewtons each. Spacecraft Commander Pete Conrad and Capsule Communicator Ed Gibson. You heard the reference to the sleep. Uh, Pete remarked, uh, considering the amount of time they slept, uh, he thought perhaps they had slept through at least 10 Capcoms. As you'll recall, they reported earlier some uh, 12 hours of sleep apiece. We presently show Apollo 12. Let me check the red lines on this one. 7,392.9 nautical miles from Earth. Uh, now traveling at uh, 3, Oh, okay. Thank you. Yeah, I was wondering. I was wondering. I was wondering. I was wondering. This is Apollo Control, Houston. Okay. Uh, 240 seems okay. Knots, I mean. Okay, well, yeah, I figured it was around there somewhere. 12, Houston, go ahead. Once I get the startup procedure down properly, I will be glad to switch to the Cyrillic cockpit instead. Stand by, Dick, and we'll be right with you. I think this is basically the delta of the Indus River. Uh, we're coming up on it. This is just one branch of it. It's uh, further along. We can sort of see the delta uh, Dick, up ahead. Uh, would you take the optic switch to zero and wait 30 seconds? Stand by, Dick. Uh, we're still looking at it. Dick, could you give us a uh, poo? I haven't mentioned what that is in a while. That's program zero zero poo. Okay, you got it. That uh, puts the computer to idle and allows them to upload information. Dick, we like to sit here and poo for about five minutes. Uh, <laughs> maybe a possible software problem. <laughs> There's no way he okay, he said that no without knowing how that sounded. There's there's no you way. Roger. Uh, he said with a straight face. From the sound of it, anyway. Pete, you were way down in the noise level there. Uh, would you say again? I don't think you want to hear it. Sounded too good to miss. I just said 
I just said that it sounds like Simp is getting back in the game again. Don't quite That's get right, that. he's been itching to go since launch. I'll bet he has since after launch, huh? That's right, about a minute after launch. So this is all basically the Indus River Delta. You can see the Indus River snaking up towards the north. 12, I can read up to you a uh, uh, portion of our news. I guess it's sort of interesting that uh, Karachi on. isn't on the Indus on the River. And it's it so far up there. I mean, it's got plenty of little tributaries or whatever you want to call them headed towards it, but it's not on the main river. Then again, uh, I mean, it's, yeah, it's still interesting. Oh, there's the lightning report. There are photographs available of the strike. The Arabian analysis is called a very interim kind of report. Hey, that's great. We're sure looking forward to seeing those felt. We saw it from inside, but we should like to see it from outside the next time. Dear said it. How did it look visually uh, from the LEM, looking at the uh, command module, uh, service module interface? Well, we've been discussing that subject, and I guess you ought to go look at some photographs of CSFs that have had LEMs on the nose, and make sure that it's not some uh, uh, LEM truck. I feel like the shader on the plane is sort of appropriate for the 80s. Right now, it's got sort of a classic look to it. I wonder if they're going to revise the weather rules for launch. They'd better revise the weather rules for launch after the thing got struck by lightning. I guess they're looking at it. Uh, what's been said so far under identical conditions with an identical spacecraft, you wouldn't do it over again. <laughs> no kidding. World's fastest lightning rod. But the world's tallest. That too. If you missed the early part of the Apollo 12 audio, uh, they got struck by lightning on launch, so that's the whole point. Apollo Control, uh, Houston, that was Pete Conrad saying, I guess we hold the world's record now as the world's fastest lightning rod. Ed Gibson, uh, capsule communicator, uh, rejoined, rejoined it with, uh, and the world's tallest. We're at uh, 90 hours, uh, 14 minutes into the flight, uh, presently showing an altitude uh, above the Earth of 176,854 nautical miles uh, for Apollo 12, and with a velocity of uh, 3,100 feet per second.
Hello, Al Houston. Clean has very visible uh, reversers on the center engine, but not so Go much ahead. on the side ones. Okay, on your request before, we showed that uh, at 36 seconds, the uh, three fuel cells went off. At 1 plus 4, 2, two fuel cells were online, and at 1 plus 7, 0, or I'm sorry, that's 142 seconds, two fuel cells were online, and at 170 seconds, uh, the third one came on. Barber pole after that 36 seconds? Oh, yeah, they indicated Barber. All, uh, all six of them, Barber pole and uh, fuel cell 1, 2, 3, light were on, and AC bus 1 and 2, light were on, and AC bus 1 and 2, over, load were on, and fuel cell bus disconnect was on, and main bus A undervolt, main bus B undervolt, and every one of those things were. Uh, Uh, reporting on the lights uh, that came up during the launch phase. We're at 190 hours, uh, 21 minutes now to the flight. Apollo 12, uh, presently 176,662.4 nautical miles away from Earth. Velocity now reads uh, 3,104 feet per second for Apollo 12. Houston, we're looking at a middle gimbal angle down here of about 58 degrees. We're approaching the border between Pakistan and India. As soon gotcha. as we reach that island in front of us, we will be in India. Hey, that's, uh, we just been uh, talking in here and uh, we just... Uh, I don't have a name for that island right now. Well, we lost the three fuel cells, which was at the 36 seconds, which was the first time lightning struck. But we didn't realize that we got hit twice. However, the platform didn't go when all the fuel cells went. So it must have been when we got hit the second time that that dumped the platform. Now it's beginning to make sense. I've been, it's been bu bugging me all along how we lost the platform uh, so late. Uh, we didn't know whether it just slowly went off because of the 24 volts or uh, what, but it sounds like now what happened was that uh, if we, in fact, really did get hit twice, why the second time that dumped the platform. Yeah, that may be. They've been looking over all the traces down here and uh, talking to all the lightning experts, and uh, I think they have some tentative ideas on that. They'll probably be uh, able to give you uh, some pretty concrete discussion on it when you get back. Apollo Control Houston, uh, 190 hours, 25 minutes. That was uh, Ed Gibson uh, conversing with Pete Conrad. Apollo 12, now 176,518 nautical miles away from home and traveling at a velocity of uh, 3,107 feet per second. Houston. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, uh, two things. Uh, first of all, I did confirm that you lost the platform at uh, 56. Uh, this is quite an intricate island. The, uh, Look at all those strike. streams. And also on the uh, optics problem, 
Bit of a swampy place, I suppose. I suspect that it may be due to operating the optic switch at the same time as verb 37. Uh, we'll be coming up to you with some disky entries to check this. Uh, I don't know what to call okay. that except for fractal. That's very fractal. And Dick, could we have a, a clarification on uh, something which happened uh, a short while ago? And that was... Uh, not so much an island as a place for streams to exist, <laughs> I mean... Uh, no visible settlements. Uh, we're suggesting down here is to uh, load in 102 or 100 and whatever it is and uh, fly with that. That should help us. EMS they're talking about there is the entry uh, monitoring system. We're at uh, 190 hours, uh, 30 minutes, now to the flight of Apollo 12. Apollo 12, Houston with the uh, disk entries. I mean, these islands, sediment is just flowing out of them. Sort of amazing okay, they're still yeah, here, but... Uh, okay, what we're doing here is setting the optic status word or op modes yep. to a known configuration. We do that with a verb... What else to think about them? Let me check two, in the one, cockpit that we're not... Oh, we are zero, beeping. One. Two thirty, then let's say. And then if you would, I said two forty earlier, but off, fine. Two thirty, then. And we'll be watching it down here mm. and uh, stand by. Try and go as fast as possible, because you know, still a four hundred seventy-one nautical mile trip. I guess limitations are limitations. I guess a lot of islands must look like that. This, that little fuzzy patch does not look okay, like a proper I'm island right there. So, welcome to India. We got a little bit of a ways to Mumbai, though. Apollo 12, Houston. Uh, that looks as though it cleared the problem. We're ready to go on with the P-23s.
Stand by, Dick. Dick, uh, what have you got? changed the whole flight. Dick, we better go ahead and get another optics cal. Okay. Dick, uh, go ahead and scratch the optics cal. Uh, looking at it, we feel you can get away without it. Follow control, Houston. Um, Dick Gordon now returning to uh, program uh, 23, his uh, navigational star sighting program. Uh, what they were doing there uh, were through uh, known disky displays, uh, calibrating the optics. Uh, an earlier suspect was that the, uh, that by operating uh, the optic switch uh, simultaneously with hitting uh, verb 37 on his keyboard uh, made the optics uh, think it should be at zero. <laughs> We're at uh, 190 hours, uh, 37 minutes now into the flight. We presently show the spacecraft Apollo 12 at a, an altitude above the Earth of 176,169 nautical miles and returning home at the present time at a velocity of uh, 3,114 feet per second. This is Apollo Control, Houston. Houston. Go ahead. Okay, clarification on uh, that optics problem. Uh, it doesn't you, seem uh, like there are too many large to cities zero. around the, this area. For uh, about 15 seconds have elapsed, you can run into the problem that you did. This is the coastal area of okay, Gujarat. Thank you. I think there are some down the way. Well, one thing on the uh, your gas separator, we'd like to uh, try and see how well that thing is working. Uh, you can go ahead and remove the gas separator cartridges and run on the H2 separator only. The nice barrier islands and, uh, up ahead. Continue on that way unless uh, it's not doing the job, and then you can go back to your normal configuration. Well, let me tell you what we've done any, uh, already. Uh, we've been running our uh, food system without the cartridge. And uh, we've been running the gun with the cartridge for the whole flight. And uh, the cold water uh, output is uh, very, very good on the food system. The hot water output still has a tendency to get some air in it, but I kind of suspect that, that there's just a little a little air or hydrogen or whatever it is in the, in the water. And when you heat the water, uh, that makes it... It's interesting. The... The coastline uh, we'll behind us is very rugged, the but the coastline ahead of us, very smooth. It's a pretty straight beach okay, right there. You, and also, uh, if we could go ahead and pick up some uh, bio data on uh, Dick Very and interesting Al. contrast. Uh, during the course of the day, we'd appreciate it. Okay, I'll have hook up. surgeon is looking at you now. And 12, when you finish up with the uh, 
P-23. This we town we're over seems to be here. called Jakau, J-A-K-H-A-U. And we're looking for a thermal problem in the high gain antenna electronics. Not totally huge, but... Okay, very good. It's there. We got something we can copy. Yeah, there seems to be some wind farms up ahead. Or at least something okay. looking Coming like at, them from a distance. At you first of all, with a switch configuration. Uh, I wonder if I can zoom in. Primary. Yep, S those are uh, wind tape, turbines. Tape recorder, PCM analog. Tape recorder to record. S band antenna, high gain. High gain power on. High gain antenna servo electronics. Okay, take it a little slower. Oh, okay. Well, let's go back. Uh, S band transponder. Primary. Yeah, you got Al really spoken. We don't take short heads up here, gang. <laughs> <laughs> There's an outflow of sediment here to our right. Go ahead. Yeah. I don't know if that's a okay, recent Al, river. I mean, uh, there's sort of a stream we can see there, that's but it doesn't look nearly as out. big as the outflow there. Maybe a bunch of stuff joining together. Okay, that's high gain power on, and then high gain servo electronics to primary. But yeah, this is quite a beach. Okay, Go right set here. Up the following attitude. Okay, you want picture zero. Yaw six niner point nine. Really straight. Goes for a long zero, way. Five zero. And attitude dead band of point five. I believe you have in there now, so it's no change. You acquire it misfin in the manual mode, and then switch to the auto react mode and narrow beam width. High gain angles for manual acquis acquisition are minus two two on pitch and yaw one nine or four. Okay, then if we detect uh, a loss of lock or if you detect uh, oscillations, turn the DSE on by placing the tape recorder switch to forward. Go, go ahead and get data for five minutes and then stop the recorder. And then at that point we've got a uh, little uh, set of procedures we'll follow through here and we can read them up to you at the time as you're going through them step by step. What essentially we're doing is uh, looking at the effect of uh, primary versus secondary transponder or primary versus secondary electronics and uh, wide beam width versus uh, narrow beam width. Okay, I understand now that you want the transponder primary. Uh, Al, could you hold yeah. it a minute? s band off tape switch. Sure. Okay, we'd like you to uh, go ahead and get that optics cal now that you're finished with the P-23. Okay, start working on it now. Okay, I'll go ahead with your readback. Okay, you want the transponder primary, and then you want to put the uh, s pad off in tape. Put the receiver to PCM analog and record. Go on the high gain with the s pad put power on with the turbo primary. Go to a spacecraft attitude of pitch, zero yaw 69.9, row 50 with a dead band of 0.5. Uh, we'll, acquire, we'll acquire a misfit manually. Switch to the react mode with narrow dead band, and those angles are minus 22 and 194. And if we notice a loss of lock, 
Uh, we noticed that uh, we get oscillation. We turn the recorder on for at least five minutes. That's right. And if you run into a loss of uh, comm, you'll be able to pick us up on Omni Bravo. Roger. Go ahead. Hey, Ed, uh, on this uh, this scale, this maneuver that you people down there on the ground are obviously noticing is quite a ways away from those attitudes where we're doing the uh, P-23 themselves. But for the next series of stars, I haven't looked at them yet, but for the next series of P-23s, uh, we can check that. We've seen sort of this pattern before on the ground, as if there was some old river there. That sort of changed course, or something to create those lighter stripes that for all purposes seem like the branches of a river. Well, there's a river here now. Raj, we could cover that down here. We'll be doing that for you, Dick. Unfortunately, I do not have the name of this river. We read you loud and clear. Up ahead is a city called Munvi. And that's also on the river. I like we're looking at it. Okay. Here comes the second one. Okay, so that river that Munvi's on is apparently called the Rukmavati River. And there's the fourth one. But there are a lot of rivers around here. Okay, Ed, that's it. Okay, that looks good, thank you. As you might expect from a place that could support a large population. Okay, Look at all the we'll fields. Sightings look pretty good. You uh, you had a good stake vector in there, and the sightings uh, essentially uh, changed. It, so your reentry angle changed by uh, just 0 0.035 degrees. Okay. We're about to head over the Gulf of Kutch. K U T C H. Apollo Control Houston at 191. Headed hours vaguely one towards a city flight. called Jamnagar. Oh. Whoop, uh, without turning that, that way, please. That was uh, Ed Gibson talking to Pete Conrad. We now show Apollo 12 at a distance away from Earth of 175,439 nautical miles. 12, go ahead. Let me double check inside the cockpit. No beeping, right? No beeping. Uh, I don't know where the fuel dials are.
Well, we're turning Roger, in. Roger, Dick. I what I'd like to do. Uh, is go ahead and leave the state vector in there that I've got and see if I can improve on it with the next series of marks. Dick, we concur. That sounds good. Go ahead and do it that way. Thank you. And Dick, when you like, uh, we could take a look on uh, at your next set of P23s on page uh, three dash one seventy three, and uh, look at your second optic scale. Uh, what do you mean the second one? Okay. Well, you do the first one, and then about uh, thirty minutes later, thirty or forty, you probably want to pick up a se uh, second one. Okay, if you um, don't get them all in before you uh, require another one, uh, perhaps the easiest way to do it is to just pitch up 57 and a half degrees so that you, uh, your zero line of sight is then right along uh, star 160. That's probably the smallest attitude change. Roger, if that's a star you happen to be going to next. That's affirmative. That's a star you happen to be working with. Okay. For the next okay, flight, I'll, I'll be taking out uh, 707 320 Air India livery, thankfully, appropriate, and uh, going from Roger, Mumbai to Jaipur. Roger, that's you're working with, whether it's 160, 171, or 163, whichever one you happen to be at. Okay. So, going across the gulf, we can sort of see the opposite shore from here. Uh, here's the 12. 12, go ahead. Uh, and, uh, I'd like to think about it. Pitch it up 57. Uh, whether I pitch you are or a combination of it depends on the ship. Angle for that particular star, does it not? Roger, Dick. Uh, we were just talking about that down here. That's a pilot pitch of uh, 57 and a half degrees, and it may be getting you into the problem with the middle gimbal angle. What we can do down here is, uh, and plan to do, is to work you up a uh, calibration star for each one of the stars you'd be working at, and we can give it to you uh, at any time you want it during the P23. Okay, well, that sounds like an awful lot of work. Why don't you give me a normal nav star, or a star that's in the vicinity of roll 090, pitch 329, yaw 332. Give me a star that's close to that. Roger, okay, we'll do that, Dick. Houston, uh, could you uh, go on back to balance couples now? we got a good state vector for you. I'm trying to get a little bit closer to Jamnagar. Stand by 12. Can't really get to the largest city in this area, Rajkot. But that's a little bit out of our way, so. 
Apollo 12, Houston. Apollo 12, Houston, uh, Houston did not send a crew alert. We're checking with the sites now. Oh, no, you misunderstood me. We had the gimbal lock light on. Okay, yeah, we misunderstood. We didn't. Yeah, we didn't put a gimbal lock, but the alert part of it was on. Apollo 12, Houston, uh, we would expect that light, and you're still about 15 degrees away from getting into, into a problem. Yeah, we're watching ahead, but we got another problem here. Look at her attitude, and I got a 5018, and I can't maneuver automatically away from this thing. Do you think we had a zero the OCDs one time? Dick, uh, say again your last comment. No, no, I think Jamnagar is going to be under some clouds and we're not particularly close enough to get a good look at it. It's uh, where those, uh, that river delta is. I think. Or even beyond that. Hard to remember that uh, 12, well, what your our number. sight range is yeah, at this altitude compared to a real air, well, let's well, say real airliner, you know, an airliner that cruises at 30,000 feet. Okay. Didn't get quite close enough, but we got no, a, we agree with the last comment, not the first one. Got a focus on our destination here. There's some facilities down here. Apollo 12, Houston. Go ahead. We got the folks down here thinking about the difference between a uh, 5018 and a 618. Are you thinking about the same thing? No, no. Uh, we, we were just dumped up sitting here looking at 69 degrees of yaw, which is sitting right next to Gimbal Lock at zero pitch and wondering why we were sitting there and it wasn't maneuvering when we were really in the right place, that's all. Apollo 12, Houston, uh, would you confirm that you've got the switch configuration as we've read up and then also if you've gone to uh, react and narrow beam? Roger, it's all set. Roger. Okay, now on that attitude... Well, got unfortunately this is going to be uh, an even longer flight than I thought it was going to be. I'll be uh, heating things up uh, as fast as we can do it. When they said cruise speed 300 knots, they uh, sort of meant it, I guess. Roger, Al. That includes the actual true airspeed. Apollo 12, Houston, uh, we see. Supposed to be 550 kilometers per hour. We're at uh, 538. Her S band aux is to tape. Probably get a little bit more juice in. Thank you. How about a reset? How about a reset? Yeah. I mean, we're more than halfway there, but still. Roger. Barely more than halfway there. The flap's still a little bit down. No. Eating. Well, Houston, we have the subcarrier now. What we're going to be doing now is uh, just sitting here and seeing if the problem will appear. And we're looking for a, uh, a six degree uh, decibel drop in signal or uh, you report a hunting uh, in the antenna. 
Okay. And 12, this could go on for a little while. Uh, we'll continue this for four hours or until uh, a problem is identified. Okay, very good. Apollo 12, Houston, uh, while you're sitting there backed up to the fire, we have some news for you if you like. Go ahead, Ed. Okay, 12, there's some pretty good football games on tap for today in the college ranks. Yeah, I was wondering when they would Ohio get to State the news. And, Tangle in a Big Ten game. and the, the only important news being the sports. One rating. If Ohio State does win and retain its number one ranking, it will be the sixth time in modern football history that a team has won the title two years in a row. In other games, UCL is favored over Southern Cal. Purdue is favored over Indiana. Oklahoma is a choice over Nebraska. And TCU should beat Rice. Princeton plays Dartmouth, and Washington meets Washington State, and we're not guessing on the outcome of any of those. Texas University is open, and they're looking towards Texas A&M on Thanksgiving. Houston uh, is picked over a tough Wyoming team. We'll keep you posted on the games uh, that are going on this afternoon. Texas is now accepting ticket orders for the Cotton Bowl and the Sugar Bowl. The winner of the Texas-Arkansas game on December 6 goes to the Cotton Bowl to face the Fighting Irish, and the loser will play Mississippi in the Sugar Bowl at New Orleans. Willie McCovery of the San Francisco Giants a beat out McCovey. Tom McCovey. receiver of the anyway, Mets for the National it. League's <laughs> Most Valuable Player Award. The big game in pro ball on Sunday is the Dallas Cowboys against the Los Angeles Rams. The Oilers will be playing uh, the Miami York Dolphins down in Florida. Meanwhile, the Oilers report that linebacker Ed Watson has been placed on waivers to make room for Woody Campbell. A Delta launch vehicle has pl place placed Britain's first communication satellite into an orbit from Cape Kennedy. It's called Skynet. Skynet. Now in an elliptical orbit, the satellite they will launched be placed Skynet. into a synchronous orbit of 22,300 miles on Sunday. Turns out Skynet wasn't and so menacing after all. Headlines. The Senate has rejected the nomination of Judge Clement Hainsworth by a 55 to 45 vote. Henry Cabot Lodge has resigned as ambassador to the Paris peace talks. And Charles de Gaulle is 79 today. <laughs> that was some raucous laughter in the background there. All three Apollo 12 wives wowed the news media yesterday as they paraded out of the Conrad House in stunning white suit pants. They each carried a sign which said, Proud, Thrilled, and Happy. Family activity will be rather restricted this weekend. Dick, Barbara will attend Mass this Sunday, or this morning at 8.30. And Al, Sue will attend a luncheon today at the Lakewood Yacht Club and will visit Mission Control this afternoon at about 3 p.m. Pete. Jane will be going shopping today for Chris's birthday present. She is also scheduled to go to the Yacht Club for the luncheon. On Sunday after church, they plan to go on a picnic at Cloverfield with the Rices. Your father-in-law is expected to arrive here sometime Sunday and will remain till after splashdown. Hi, kid. You're welcome. Thanks, apparently, at Pillow's Husky. You have those cougars today. Will do it, Nick. And 12, it's been about uh, five hours now since you started accelerating back towards the Earth. Apollo Control Houston at uh, 191 hours, uh, 33 minutes. Uh, Ed and I have us at uh, 15.2 miles. 
Lots of little uh, Roger, wind turbines down there. I, have this, uh, I, have this, uh, I don't know if they're supposed to be there, but maybe. suppose and there's no I reason that they would appear in the scenery if they weren't actually there. Sounds good. They're all right on. I do not have a firm grasp on the particulars of the power situation in various the areas of India, distance. so uh, that was Dick Gordon uh, reporting except, uh, on uh, take the scenery's word for it. Distance from Earth and velocity. The uh, reference Ed Gibson made as he just prior to reading up the news, uh, the reference to backed up to the fire refers to the attitude uh, which the spacecraft is currently in, which puts the uh, service propulsion system engine bell uh, toward the sun. They're in this attitude, uh, uh, running a, a test uh, on the communications uh, system between uh, the spacecraft and the ground. Uh, these procedures have been passed up a short while ago to them. We're at uh, 191 hours, uh, 35 minutes into the flight, and this is Apollo Control, Houston. Uh, Houston 12. It's sort of interesting ahead. how different stuff on Google Maps uh, looks, yeah, yeah, like to, making it hard for me thing. to We've, get uh, a sense of exactly which river that is, for instance. Again, there are a lot of rivers around here. Some very close to each other. Okay, Dick, we'll do that. Oh, I see some mountains up ahead in the mist. Apollo 12, Houston, with some news on how your LSEP is doing. Go, man. Okay, your, the central station is still performing well. RTG output is around 73 watts. And as of uh, just a short while ago, they've sent up a total of 382 commands. TSE has uh, gotten into a stable temperature equilibrium around 126 degrees. And they uh, have observed uh, three, uh, three of different, at three different times, the tracings uh, have showed that there was some seismic activity taking place. The LSM is a uh, is increasing in activity as the moon is entering a magnetic uh, zone. It looks like the there's some kind of dam there, waves, or as something. The moon is approaching the center of the Earth's magnetic tail near lunar noon, where the field where the field is the lowest, and at that point the uh, LSM site survey. The river sure contracts. And the solar wind is uh, perking right along and doing real well. And. Uh, this city to our left is Doraji. Hey, Ed, from all they know now about watching the temperatures, do they forecast this will last for two years? Yeah, I think that dam is uh, okay, Bandar Dam 2. Uh, don't have, have a name on the river, they, though. Uh, extended that far. Maybe I'll the Bandar River. To that, that would make sense. And 12 Houston, uh, the folks down here have thought a little bit about your two EVAs, uh, especially the geology involved, and have a few questions uh, which were stimulated by what you said during the EVAs and after it. And any time that you'd like to have a discussion of those questions, uh, we're sitting here waiting for you. Okay, 
Okay, Ed, we're in the middle of a big garbage cleanup right now, and uh, as soon as we get the place spruced up, we'll uh, be with you. Thanks, about another hour or so. Okay, Pete. Apollo Control Houston, uh, we're presently at uh, 191 hours, uh, 48 minutes into the flight. And now show Apollo 12. City up at, ahead uh, is Junagon. 174,000, uh, 29.8 nautical miles out from Earth. Uh, and those mountains are part of some coming in now at uh, 3,159 feet per second. We'll At least there's the a green area on the map. Continue to monitor any conversations as uh, they develop. That was uh, Ed Gibson passing along the news of Alsep. Uh, to These cities the aren't Apollo particularly Control small crew. cities. They're not huge, but still, Junagad here is, is 320,000 in 2011, so it's probably more now. Apollo 12, Houston, in another three minutes, we'll have a site handover and you'll get a temporary loss of signal. Okay. This seems like, uh, it would have been volcanic, I don't know for sure, though. Houston 12. It's just a very definite ring, it seems like. 12, go ahead. But could be something else. Okay, Pete, we'll be with you in just a minute. It's Apollo Control Houston at 192 hours, uh, 17 minutes town uh, the flight. at the foot of that, uh, that mountain was, uh, Pete Conrad in the center calling, of the ring. Uh, capsule communicator Ed Gibson saying they're ready for the geology questions. Oh. One question is, uh, could you give a little more elaborate description of the pattern ground with the ridges and grooves? Uh, that is, were there several scales of the pattern? And uh, was there a difference in the bearing strength of the surface on the patterned uh, ground? Uh, you're, you're referring to the uh, things that look like uh, streaks and uh, that we talked about that uh, were in different directions also than the lamp, uh, so that they weren't effects of the lamp exhaust plume. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, you talked, you, you described some which were um, perpendicular to the, dis uh, the direction which you thought the exhaust plume would normally give uh, pattern ground. Yeah, if I, if I remember correctly, that was in the surveyor crater, and uh, I think that uh, we notice these radial uh, streaks almost everywhere, don't you agree, Al? Yeah, we'd see some, and then we'd go through an area that wouldn't have any, and then we'd see another area, and then there'd be an area that didn't have any. So we were seeing them frequently, you know, they weren't very isolated, but they were all over. The ones down in the Surveyor Crater were from, uh, looked to me like this uh, northeast north running southwest, would you say? and then maybe the ones out in front of the lab, for example, they were north running south and maybe northwest running south. I can't remember now, but I'm sure it's on the voice tape. The size, as I recall, Peter may recall them differently. It's hard to remember, but some of these things, they look to me like they were about... I sort of had a choice coming up. Whether I make a beeline to Mumbai and fly over a whole lot of water or whether I try and hug the coast a little bit more, but I think I'll go straight there, but it's gotta be a long stretch of just water. And then maybe then they were about three eighths of an inch between uh little uh hills. Something like that would be my guess. What do you think, Pete? Yeah, I, I agree with that. Now you mentioned bearing strength. I think the bearing strength of the ground, uh generally speaking, in the surveyor crater and up around as we approached it from the far side on our traverse and everything was probably some of the firmest ground we were on. It was the ground that we sank in the least. There was that one place we got into when we got out, way out with a sharp crater out, uh, where we felt that the ground was uh, 
much more soft and powdery, and, and uh, we were uh, therefore not as good bearing strength. Yeah, I think it was sharp. That's what yeah. they do. And I can't, uh, I can't say that I remember any radial patterning out there at sharp, but to speak of, I don't remember any either. One thing, well, we know we did that gold camera right at the very end, and I don't think I was able to get any of that pattern ground. I should have, but the time just ran out, and before I could get a very many pictures, we came back in. I did take it with a 70 millimeter several times. Well, Roger, uh, over what extent did that pattern ground uh, occur, and can you relate it to anything that you've seen back here? Uh, interesting sort of cross hatching on some of these hills. Well, I don't think we paid that much attention to it, uh, other than that when we were aware of it, it was all around us like the surveyor crater. Uh, going down, I guess walking down to the surveyor is when we noticed it in there while we were resting. And uh, to what extent it went, I, I really can't say. But uh, like Al said, I think uh, uh, we came across it in several places. Uh, I would, I, I don't think it's more an impression than anything else, but I, I really don't remember it out there by Sharp Crater or anything, and that's where the ground was sort of soft and uh, maybe finer grain junk yeah, that we've been on. So that, that may be a very pertinent point, that the more firmer ground that we were on, the more we would see this radial or pattern streak. Hey, and that's something else I hadn't thought of, Pete. Remember that firm ground also was the same ground we came up on when I said it looks like this ground has got kind of little blobs in it and it looks like what a nice smooth level dirt field would look like if it just had the very light rain on it. Yeah, that's all we looked at that. That was, uh, yeah, you're right, that was when we were on firm ground right there. That's a good point. I hadn't thought of that. Uh, I do remember looking at that patterned ground to see where it went. And it usually if I was near it and looked out in the distance, it looked like it went in the direction of the groove. As far as I could see out in that direction, you know, and, and be able to see any detail that fine. In other words, I never did look either left or right on those groove patterns where I, it did look to me like it went all the way out to the limit of vision for seeing them. I never saw any sort of contact uh, along the... the uh, yeah, so far I can't say I've seen a landscape quite like this before. Crater, other places we have to walk around. Interesting. Oh, I suppose I would expect to yeah, see quite a lot of interesting saw, things from I the Indian subcontinents given the, the way the, discussed, the like Himalayas were the formed and all the other business going. We saw the kind with the interesting little, like, on it. to the area. We saw some more finely powdered ground like out around Sharp Crater and we saw some more finely powdered like just down on the inside of the small craters and some, to some extent on the inside of uh, uh, I tried to start the flight fairly early but it took me quite a while to figure out how to start the plane <laughs> so, and it's getting a little bit darker I wasn't intending to fly close to sunset but here we are or you just have to be thinking about it or looking at it at the time there was no distinguishing in colors or anything like that. Now, there might be a subtle enough distinction in colors that uh, from a far distance, that's where rays uh, out of these craters uh, give you that that pattern. But when you're standing right up close to it, uh, that was not at all apparent that there was anything different in color. Yeah, that color is so deceptive. I can recall now, looking at all the material around the lab the first day we were out, it's making some comments. I don't recall what I said. Probably more gray brown or gray, gray, white. And then the second day I was out, the very same places, and I wasn't really aware of it. At the time, I kept talking about it being light brown. All the rocks I kept thinking had a light tan coating. Whereas the first day, I thought they had a light gray coating. My impression now is, and it could be completely wrong, but you know, I'm going to be anxious to see the rocks when we get home. If we picked up all the different kinds of rocks we saw that had to do with texture and shape and anything else we could see, which wasn't much, believe me, I looked hard. 
But my impression is we're going to crack those rocks open. And what we do, we're going to find, we should have done this on the lunar surface with a hammer. We're going to find that those things are dark gray basalt. Also, every time we came in the lab, both times, Pete's suit and my suit looked the same gray color. I never saw anything but that dark gray. I never saw any of the browns that I'd seen outside or anything like that. Yeah, our suits look like we've been wallowing around in graphite. A dull graphite. That's right, it was about that thin, fine to it, and it clung to everything. There were some points there where you talked about uh, seeing large white okay. boulders in the There's distance. There's the southern coast of Gujarat, we can see. Things which appear and then we have to strike out uh, over... White, or do you think it was I don't know, I guess... Which, uh, the sun was what is it called? Of, Something uh, of Gujarat, I would expect. Uh, what is... Well, we discussed that again when we got back up in nope. orbit. And, and, uh, Doesn't uh, seem to have a... That, that the high sun angle, ought to be a name for it. Uh, the ground look white to us from orbit and everything. And I think Up a little bit further I north, it's got matter, a I name, the Gulf of Kumbat. But down where we're crossing, it doesn't have any labeled name on Google Maps. I think that's one of the diff most different things about the lunar surface that I saw from the Earth's surface. was the fact that where the sun is has such a great effect on the color. Well, you take on Earth and have some sort of rock laying on the ground, the sun can move a long way, and the rock still pretty much looks the same. And when you pick it up and kind of shade it with your body or something on the ground, you can usually get a good index of the color. You do that on the moon, and it, it just, you just can't hardly see the rock. But when it's in the sun, it just changes colors with the sunlight. That's, it, that's one of the most uh, predominant differences that I can see. Yeah, now, Al mentioned a very good point. There's no doubt about it. It seems the like on the map, uh, the, the island that we see to sort of to our forward However, right is a separate the, uh, province. It's not Gujarat. Uh, it's Daman and Diu. Uh, and it's called Diu and Island. Again, I, I think it's Interesting. Of the greater it's own sort of thing. City right below us there is called Una. Well, that's where we are, basically. Yeah, I agree with Pete. Now, one interesting thing, when we were out at their surveyor that was sort of tan, my initial impression was that the radiation or something had darkened the paint. But when you look at the chrome surface, the only surfaces I saw that didn't look this way were the buried surfaces, by the way. But you look at the chrome surfaces, of, uh, that, for example, that battery box. And it had changed almost the same color, that light tan. Now, maybe if we looked at it the first day and, and it had been in sunlight, it wouldn't look light tan, it would look light gray. But it looked light tan, you'll be able to get this, of course, because we got the cameras with us. But when I rubbed the box, the box, it took off the light gray coloring, and, but it just didn't dust off. So I, I'm pretty sure that we didn't put it on with our limb. Because it wasn't just like dust that hangs around your house. It's only been there a day or two. It was like dust that's collected on there for a long time. And long enough, had some effects on it long enough till it really becomes a, not a thick coating, but a very uh, cohesive, cohesive coating. It was almost like a skin on there. And you had to rub hard to get it off that battery box. But when you did, there was a nice shiny uh, chrome beneath it. it. It was kind of a strange thing, like, bunch of dust had blown on the box that it had stood there long enough to really get hard. Well, I think there's going to be enough parts that have not been touched by either our gloves or by the bag that the camera is in that you'll be able to get a good hack on that. Raj, I imagine also like, we've... Uh, like the TV mirror. Go ahead, Pete. Uh, yeah, the TV mirror has only my finger mark on it, and I'm sure that nothing else has touched any of the rest of that TV mirror, and it was covered with this this fine uh, dust. Also in the in the same place with the mirror, Pete, although our mock-up didn't look this way as I remember, there's a lot of electronics exposed in behind that mirror that, of course, we never could possibly touch. It should have the same coating in there or something. Well, the other most important thing is, is the surveyor was equally brown all the way around it. 
and had we covered it coming in, I, I think we'd have seen a directional pattern on the surveyor. So I don't think, as a matter of fact, the way that dust flew when we landed, I don't think any of it landed within 10 miles of where we landed. It just took off. That's, I kind of agree. And even if it did, it wasn't going to fall in the crater. It just shoot right across it. Yeah, and the, the surveyor was lower than we were. Hey, did, I just thought of an interesting possible point that somebody wants to do when they get with that camera. The geologists want to look at when they get the camera before they give the scientists is back in there behind that mirror uh, where all the radiation could get into it couldn't get into as much as it could let's say the top the camera got radiation all day long because it'd get it to bit the sun came up and it'd get it all the way around the sunset but inside that little hole where the mirror rotates there's going to be parts in there easily calculable that got just only a certain amount of sun each each individual day. Let's like say some parts would only get 10% of the sun the outside, some parts of the inside would get 50%. So if they're very careful with that uh, mirror surface at the back of the mirror and inside that little hollow place, they're liable to be able to get some index of how fast this stuff builds up and when it does. Roger, were you able to notice any kind of vertical... I have to be careful. Go ahead. I think you're going to want to have something thought through on that before that camera goes whistling off in the distance because it isn't going to take a lot of pooling around with before all that information would be lost. Yeah, that's true. We'll have to be very careful how we handle that. Did you notice any vertical gradient in the uh, color on the surveyor as you might expect if it was dust? slowly losing sight of the land behind us and it's a long trek to Maharashtra which is ahead of us where Mumbai is okay a question on the uh, vesiculation of rocks did you really notice That'd be a good time to spend some time inside the cockpit Hunt for the fuel gauge uh, over here. Funny. Seems uh, like uh, would be a good play. Generator. Well, that's all electrical already, stuff. Uh, that type of structure. I agree with Pete. One time I reported I did, and then I looked at the rock where we finally picked it up, and it didn't look like it at all. It had a bunch of pits on it, but it cabin didn't temperature seems a bit it, cold. And we were all doing something else, so I never really went back and corrected myself. But I kind of agree with Pete. I never saw any particular material at all. I, I'm not convinced that we got too much different kind of rock material to tell you the truth. I, 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 of course, I got fooled out there in the desert and uh, saw anything that we saw that remotely resembled being different. And to our eye, we, we brought you a sample. And, yeah, I don't uh, think, I don't think we, I think we got every, I think we got a sample of uh, almost everything that was there. Everything that we saw that was different texture or the I way mean, the there's weather, pressures or I see the say, pressures or anything else that seemed unusual to us about diff the difference oh. in the rocks hmm. we, we grabbed some of them but uh, like Pete says it's going to be interesting to see how many different things we did actually get Information might be behind the steering column, Pete, but we able to I haven't figured out how to get rid of the which appeared to be the yokes on the head crater or any of the other craters, similar to the type of tracks you saw after you rolled that one rock down. Dot. Dot that. Uh, well, let me let me say this. I was uh, without walking down. No, well, let's see crater. about the info over here. Uh, Not the slide rule. I was, I, I couldn't tell what kind of a track. Nope, that has nothing to do with fuel. That I rolled down there to start with. Uh, however, I think we have enough tan photos. And oh, okay, 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 okay. Yeah. Fine, fine. Two, 220 then, 220. Yeah, I think that's the best point right there. Right, 220, fine. Okay. I don't remember seeing any myself, but I think. 
I, I also don't remember specifically looking for them. Yeah, usually when you see them... I remember why I'm not in like here. That, you'll remember it. But uh, maybe there's some around I just didn't even notice. Hey, let me uh, ask... Uh, we're pretty close to the service ceiling. Uh, That's supposed to be 26,000 feet. We passed a particular area, and I'll have to go back to the map and look, where there were three or four bright craters that had very, very dark gray material uh, streaking down the sides of them like landslides. Now, we were aware of many places, but using the binocular of seeing landslide well, type or slide or something. I suppose. In all the craters all At all this point, the either we have the fuel or we don't. <laughs> but there were only these three or four craters that had very decided gray uh, slumps or streaks or something that almost gave me the impression. Uh, no point trying to figure that out, I guess. Liquid spill or something. I mean, it was so different than anything else. Has anybody reported that or have you seen them in your photographs from Earth uh, before? We'll try and get an answer to that, Pete. Uh, that, that boulder track business got me thinking about that. Go ahead with your question. Yeah, let me let me say something else, too, and I can't remember if I said it. You know, we when we talked with Al Chittister and the guys before we went about the main objectives of the geology wasn't to go out and grab a few rocks and take some pictures, but to try to understand the morphology and the stratigraphy and what have you of the vicinity you're in. Look around and try to use your head along these lines. Well, I'll tell you, it wasn't less than 10 times I stood in spots, including in the limb, both times we were back in and said, okay, now, B, what can you do in that, can you fill that square? Is it possible to look out there and try to determine where this came from, which is first, which is second, and all that? And except for deciding which craters look newer than others, which we know from ground uh, observations. Well, at least during this long flight, we've got their full account of what it was like on the moon. And we were when we were out at Meteor Crater and other places that gave us those kind of clues. That whole area is just has been acted on by these meteoroids or something else. So that all these features that are normally neat clues to you on Earth are not available. Be Conrad is good at describing things. I didn't find any way to fill that those two big squares. You know, I never was able to walk oh, it up fast, to a crater to determine when the normal ground stopped and the ejector started, except on the difference in slope or the fact that it got a little bit more powdier under my feet. And that's not a very good index. We never saw anything. You have a different color or a different amount of rocks or anything else, except the times that P and I were kicking up that very light uh, gray as opposed to the to the more uh, uh, dark cement gray material. There's just no contacts to look at. I think uh, I think even a uh, a trained geologist would have trouble doing a whole lot of field geology that way. On the moon, I think what's going to have to what's going to have to do is pick your traverses like we did, and and, and just sort of uh, select at a at a regular interval as you go along, and then come back and analyze this stuff to find out differences. I, I, I've kind of got the idea that a, a lot of it is the same, and the only difference being the geologists are one another by at this moment incensed, though. By, uh, it's one thing to give a description, another thing to say that the geologists won't know what they're looking at. I think one of the things you're going to want to up, too, is you're going to want to up the number of core tubes so that you can get down in these areas you're interested in and find out what's going on under there. Because it's covered with this layer, and there just ain't no way to figure it out. I know, thinking back, and, and like I say, before the... Geologists the uniformly going, going, well, if I was there... I would have figured it out. Trying to get the big picture, trying to, to be more than rock collectors and picture takers. And uh, believe me, we worked at it. And I, I think from our training, we were pretty doggone good at getting that sort of thing in training. Not just grabbing a few rocks, but trying to... Well, this sort of talk definitely encouraged uh, them to ensure that the later missions got proper geology training. On the surface. It's got this big blanket of all beat up soil over every single thing. 
And of course, Apollo 17 carried an actual geologist, finally. Now, if you don't want to get a lot of quarters, but you want to see what's going on, maybe we need to get some sort of better trenching tool where the guy can lean over and trench down six or eight inches, or at least as far as, as the ground is soft, and then take a look at down what's underneath it. We, uh, we were really hindered in the fact that we could not bend over. Uh, it, it wasn't as apparent in our training as it was up there because in your training when you weigh 285 pounds there in the building and you got all that stuff on your back it's it's fairly easy to sort of squinch down or or lean quite a bit you can't do that up there on the moon and uh like i al just said and i'm short and low to the ground to begin with as <laughs> taller than i am is going to have a difficult time with the same lane tool trenching as deep as, as i did uh because you just can't get over. And uh, we, we really, we've got a whole bunch of ideas and we're gonna, in the five days there at the MQF, we'll put all this down on paper on what we think we could do to pass on some suggestions to approve the tools that we have right now uh, to do a little better job. Yeah, I think those tools can really be uh, worked over. They seemed pretty good before we left, but once we got out there and started working with them, it had one six G and like because you can't always do the same things. You're leaning in a different way, and uh, things are a little different. I think we thought about it enough and, and observed it enough that we could come back and give some pretty good suggestions for tool improvement and equipment improvement along those lines. It'll help the next guys get more rocks and better rocks and faster and trench deeper and do more core tubes or whatever else they want to do. You tell them they can start fixing that doggone hammer. <laughs> Fix the hammer. Okay, thanks for your comments. Yeah, we concluded that the, There's the, almost a smile you know, in his voice. I heard there. Delicate to start with, uh, the extension ham handle was about wiped out by the time Al got done driving that double core tube. Yeah, that, even though you're light up there and everything's light, you can still get something like a hammer swinging, or if you get moving and want to stop, you can still put some pretty good loads on some equipment. Okay, Pete, now that's it for the questions. Thanks very much. Uh, could you give us an, uh, a reading off the O2 pressure gauge on the repress pack? Yeah, one more thing that we did get back to this crater morphology and all that business. Uh, when we looked at those craters, we tried to do that too. Because we could see bedrock, or what we thought was bedrock on the outside, we said, great, we're going to look at those craters. This is what we said before we even got out. We're going to look at those craters, and we're going to see a deep contact between the regolith and the bedrock. And we're going to go down a little bit further, and here's going to be something else. We really got it knocked. We looked at those craters, and what it looks like is just like the surface, except there's a few rocks that seem to be resting on the wall and resting in the bottom. Now, if you went down there and dusted away all that material, I don't know how much there is there, maybe you'd find the contact between the, the regolith and the, and the ground bedrock, but, you know, you really couldn't see it. Now, maybe you could infer it from the pictures we took and what we discussed, because it usually was showing here and there, particularly on that very last crater. But uh, that's going to that's good. take some work. It's, it's just not like looking at a crater on Earth. I think the uh, the uh, fact that it has this makes uh, geology up there as, as difficult, if not more difficult, as it is on the Earth because you have trees and uh, grass and all kinds of things like that that hide a lot of, of the Earth's geology. So uh, I think you're in the same box up there. What's the part of that? Wait, what? The repress package is 850 psi. Another thing that's been concerning me a little bit, you know, we keep talking about going to all these neat places like Hygienus Rill and all that stuff because we're going to stand on the side right below the rill. We're going to look up on that big high side, and right there is going to be the history of the moon 
like sort of like the Grand Canyon gives us such a great one of the Earth. Well, I'll tell you, if the size of that place or anything like the size of craters or the size of the surveyor, you're going to look up there and you're going to see a bunch of dust just like you see on the surface. Unless there's, you know, unless uh, I could be easily wrong. We hadn't been there. But uh, we just didn't see any places, no matter what the slope, that didn't have all this uh, uh, material all over it. Well, they're going to have to come up with a strategy to deal with the dust, aren't they? This is Apollo Control Houston at uh, 192 hours, uh, 46 minutes into the flight. Uh, you've been listening to a long uh, discussion on uh, geology between Pete Conrad and Al Bean aboard the spacecraft and Ed Gibson here at Mission Control Center. Along with uh, Gibson at his side is uh, astronaut geologist uh, Jack Schmidt, who is working with Ed in uh, preparing the questions. While we uh, have a slack moment in conversation, we would like to uh, pass along an announcement. There will be an ALSEP briefing for newsmen in the main auditorium at 12 noon today. So the VC counter, it looks as though the thing's working pretty well from what we can determine. We would look back at uh, mid course two, LOI one, LOI two, and the lunar orbit plane change, uh, both of them and TEI, and it looks as though it's uh, the predicted and the crew readout are doing pretty well. They're pretty, pretty close agreement. Okay, that's it. Well, we should be in view of Mumbai soon, hopefully. Uh, probably the dust cases uh, make it harder to spot than normal. Okay, just checking for beeping in this case. At this point, there's a fair chance I could glide in without the engine with the nice wing. But I don't know about the wing loading on this. Hmm. It's got a 70 meter square wing and empty weight of 9.4 tons. I don't think that's too bad. Houston, uh, we presently show an altitude of within tolerance, however, Dick. Oh, that's, that's correct. I, I, I recognize that. I just wanted you to know that that's what, we're, what we've got, and I guess that's just the real world. We uh, presently show an altitude of 172,138 nautical miles above the Earth for Apollo 12. Now traveling at uh, 3,200 and uh, eight feet per second. Hey, one last comment there. Uh, you said, how about telling old Joe Clint that we both thought we were in Kapoho tube when we were on that boot, and we gave him uh, about the same uh, type of information that we gave him the Kapoho as far as it was visible. Roger, Al, will do. Well, I think I can start the set now. Apollo Control, Houston. Uh, Kapoho uh, is on the Big Island of Hawaii. We're at uh, 192 hours, uh, 51 minutes into the flight.
12, Houston. Go ahead, Houston. I'll say, if it's uh, possible for you to see out of the rendezvous windows uh, to get a good shot at the moon, we'd like to get some more uh, small-scale, high-latitude photographs, and this would be at your convenience. If you think you can do it, uh, give us a call and we'll give you some procedures. Okay, now we just took some uh, about two hours ago, some 250 millimeter uh, of the moon, which uh, of course are full frame. Uh, would you care for something now? Uh, and what lens would you like? It sounds as though you uh, pretty well outguessed us. Uh, it'd be a Hasselblad with a 250 millimeter lens, black and white film, uh, 5.6, 1 250th, and of course at infinity. And if you take uh, two or three photos and repeat approximately 30 minute intervals uh, for one hour. Okay, uh, we'll uh, tell you the f-stop again, that's the only thing I didn't hear. Oh, okay, we got it, I'm sorry. 5.6. Houston. Go ahead. Apollo 12, Houston, are you observing any variation? Serious in the pinkish clouds all over the place? Perhaps blocking our view of uh, the city? No. I've been uh, sort of watching it. Uh, and, uh, and we might still be 20, the only more than 20 I've miles out, this though. Whole time is every once in a while uh, the yaw will just wiggle one time, just the space, and that's the only thing I see. Otherwise, it's been steady as a rock. Okay, we just picked up a little variation of signal strength down here. Okay, now wait a minute. The, uh, your, that just made a liar out of me because it's just starting to do it up here. We can signal strength vary it, and it's doing it in yaw. Roger, sure we've just, in yaw. just started to pick that up down here. DSE on, please. Oh, put the uh, DSE on, Roger. Okay, now the recorder's on and then we're in low. Do you want us to go to high bit rate? Affirmative. High bit rate. It's Apollo Control Houston at uh, 192 hours, uh, 59 minutes. Apollo 12 going... Uh, through a test exercise now with the sun looking at the face of the antenna. We uh, presently show Apollo 12 as at uh, 171,819 nautical miles away from Earth. Okay, I see some lights finally through the clouds. Mostly behind the clouds though. Apollo 12, tape recorder to stop. Thank you, 12. It looks as though it's settled down. Uh, let's just keep an eye on it. Twelve DSE to forward. Control Houston, uh, the DSE being uh, data storage equipment. Uh, it stores data and voice information during flight and uh, during periods uh, of lost communications and plays them back later. 
We're at 193 hours, four minutes into the flight. Apollo 12 now at an altitude of 171,664 oh, nautical miles and that's above the Earth. that's our airport. Present the velocity, uh, 3,212 feet per second. Chhatrapati Shivaji International. Houston, Apollo 12. Well, Houston, go ahead. Uh, Roger, let me give you uh, the angles on the TDC at this time. Go ahead. Okay, roll. 072 decimal 25. Pitch is 352 decimal 4. Oh, we can see it from here. I would have liked to fly by downtown. The next flight is with a faster plane, the 707. Roger, Dick, copy. Uh, but it's also pretty dark already. Three five two decimal four zero eight one decimal five five. Thank you. Go, Roger. I'm gonna get another one later on before it needs a fast two. Okay. The airport is pretty far away from the main uh, city. No, it's sort of. It should be Go close ahead. enough. I'll just fly straight in. It looks like what the antenna has done now is uh, driven to some position other than optimum and it's just sitting there. You can see the peninsula up ahead. That's, that's Mumbai. Roger, Pete. We're not seeing a whole bunch of tall buildings right now, though. 12, would you go to wide beam left? So, do we have Try air brakes? Thank you. Mm, not as such, no. Well, in that case, Apollo we may 12, have to take uh, a little bit more time to descend. Off. That's a nice view though. Oh, just as I say that, uh, right clouds. Here, of course there'd be clouds. Apollo okay. 12, is the antenna holding steady at the present time? More clouds? Probably more clouds. Uh, as best as I can tell it is, it has moved a little bit from where it was a little while ago, but it's not wobbling like it was doing the other day. Roger. Where's my instrument lights? Uh, I take that back. It may be wobbling just a little. Landing lights. Window heat. Just a very slight oscillation in single strength. Mm -hmm. And maybe... Uh, okay, 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 okay. Right. Lights, night. I just thank you. I seem to click on this though. Pretty sure that might be helpful. But uh, all right. Yeah, that's, uh, With my yeah. luck, the real relevant controls are probably on the. Roger, yeah. Fuel quantity, port and starboard. Right. I was expecting that. Um, yeah, the relevant quant uh, controls uh, for the lights are probably the on the co-pilot side. Anyway, let me check the map. We are off. Well, we're probably too high to try and come around on this pass. Nine nautical miles. Yeah, we'll have to make a U-turn. Probably safer that way, just because of the clouds. For your next B23 at uh, 195, we have a uh, another calibration star, which I think will work out a little bit better for you when you're ready to copy. Go ahead. That's a star two four, Gyna, and the attitude is roll zero nine two, pitch three two nine. 
yaw, zero. And that should give you a pretty small angle difference between uh, the next attitude you'll be going to. Okay, thank you. Appreciate it. This ought to be a very interesting one, too, uh, because uh, I noticed on the other series of... Be helpful if that showed something. Nothing more to see out here than in there. Okay, seriously though. Apollo Control, Houston. Uh, Can you that click was this? Capsule communicator Ed Gibson talking to uh, huh? Dick Gordon uh, concerning their his, his next set of navigational star sightings. We now show Apollo 12 at 171,111 nope. nautical miles away from Earth and traveling at a speed of 3,222 feet per second. Apollo 12, Houston, would you put the DSE at forward, please? Mm. At 12, could we have the track mode to narrow? Nope, just defrost stuff over there. Cabin lighting. Roger. That's already on. And I can't click. Okay. Meanwhile, oh, there's some Roger, lights. Dick, I like to trade you something. Okay, uh, I think we can get below these clouds at least. Not yet, Ed. Not yet. Two more days and you can't move it. Okay, well, Copilot's a little bit worried about the altitude, I suppose. So, Paolo, well, Houston, could we have secondary electronics? Okay, so, landing gear extent is 300. And... Best I can tell, that's more than 300 right there. Apollo Control Houston at 193 hours mm -hmm. 42 minutes in the flight. I think uh, I can make an estimate the, based on knots too. A brief earlier comment uh, from Dick Gordon about the uh, chocolate pudding. They're definitely low uh, enough. Uh, a butterscotch pudding and the chocolate pudding. Obviously uh, undergoing a lunch break. We uh, show Apollo 12 presently at 170,488. Okay, Ooh, that's miles. loud. Traveling at a speed of 3,236 feet per second. Continuing to monitor, uh, this is Apollo Oh control. god, what's that sound? That might be the one big flaw with this. That sound. This is Apollo Control Houston at uh, 193 hours 44 minutes into the flight. Apollo 12 now at uh, an altitude above Earth. Is it like retracting and sending over and over again, or...? Traveling in at a speed of uh, 3,237 feet per second. At uh, this time, uh, okay. we will take I think the release line that solved down that problem. Okay. To allow Hopefully. You to listen to an again, it's because of the way I've will be taking place shortly set in the main auditorium of things. Building 1. This is Apollo Control Houston. Well, I probably should have seen where the cabin lights were. Whoa! Oh god! Oh god! Control at 194 hours 38 minutes. <sighs> Apollo 12 is 168,721 nautical miles from Earth. Should have seen where the cabin lights were before I. Feet per second. Roll left max. Okay. All right. All right. Of, uh, all right. That's fine. Doing That's not the worst warning I've ever had. This exercise moved up one hour from the flight plan. Mm -hmm. At the uh, completion of the S-band high gain antenna test, it was decided to proceed on with the P-23 navigation oh. sightings rather than go into oh, there it is. passive thermal control for an hour and then start the sighting. So. 
Okay, okay, okay. You don't want that much that roll. Got it. Got it. Was moved Got up it. one hour, and the crew is in the process of doing Holy that now. Holy crap! There's been very little conversation uh, during the Alcep news briefing. What conversation there has been has pertained to either the uh, antenna test or the, the navigation sightings. We have turned oh, that tape the roll over thing to is the transcript. Kinda... Yeah, we're People. too high. We will now continue to stand by live for any uh, further air ground communication. And too far off, too. Uh, not again. Houston, bar 12. Door 12. Guess what? I don't have a star. I didn't like what I did in Karachi with the fighter plane and I'm not gonna like this either but I can barely see what the, what's going on around here these days hate not lining up properly ahead of time uh, Dick you're gonna have to try that once again we're, we're breaking up in communications and we don't read you down here Roger, how do you hear me now? still breaking up uh, but probably readable try it Okay, I do not have a star for star number five, six. First uh, six set, star two, four. Okay. Roger. Tell the boys in the back room I don't have a star for this particular one in the field of view. I can't see it. Ooh, Roger, we'll okay, it. well, we're here. And I think I'll take that taxiway. Uh, Dick, part so, of that welcome to Mumbai. Sure Wish we had gotten a better view of it. Hopefully, of we can casting. get a good view uh, with the 707. So, you know, it's a fairly fast plane. We'll see what we can do. And I have to learn this plane a lot more, it seems. Okay. Especially uh, where the, the light uh, controls uh, are. Uh, star two, four, but uh, let me stop it right here and stop the audio and uh, with that I'll say thank you for watching I hope you enjoyed this video if you did enjoy this video please do press like if you have any comments or suggestions please leave them in the comment section below and I'll see you next time